uh, you're very welcome to answer a broadsheet reader, which is a temporary uh, show to replace broadsheet on the telly because we've lost Neil Curran, the host of broadsheet on the telly. He's somewhere, and if he's watching this, perhaps he'd get in touch with myself or Vanessa Foran, who is overseeing the operation tonight. Um, Vanessa Foran, celebrity accountant. Hello, everybody. Uh, overseeing is just about the height of it. <laughs> like Price Waterhouse with the, with the Oscar winner. St <laughs> Stokes Kennedy Crowley. <laughs> well, uh, and in the answer board sheet, hot stool is Dr. Marcus de Bruyne. Good evening, um, Dr. de Bruyne. Good evening to you, John. Thank you for having me on. And uh, um, Dr. de Bruyne, this is Vanessa, Vanessa Foran. So Hello, Dr. Dr. de Bruyne. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, Dr. De Bruyne, reluctant celebrity doctor. Uh, Social um, influencer. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, the format of the show is we have 30 minutes. Uh, Dr. De Bruyne will answer all your questions that you've left under the post from earlier this evening. And uh, a brief bio on uh, Dr. De Bruyne. Um, Marcus is uh, from Rush, uh, County Dublin. He's a family GP. He was appointed to the Medical Council by then Minister for Health, Simon Harris, and earlier this year resigned from the Medical Council over the nursing home scandal. And then, two days ago, was told that he was the subject of a formal investigation by the Medical Council uh, for a speech or for his attendance at a rally at the Customs House and uh, two of his colleagues complained, I think, for the reasons, uh, the, the alleged political affiliations of some of those uh, attending the event. Nevertheless, it's about your questions. So, uh, if Vanessa, <laughs> um, my uh, overseer can, uh, or the show's overseer can show us the, the first question. Okay, uh, first question there is in from um, uh, White Dove. Okay, um, Marcus, looking forward to hearing you. Do you feel that the Swedish approach should have been adopted in Ireland? Also, has anyone looked at the Irish uh, death rate from March, August 2020 and compared it to March, August in other years? Well, look, it's, it's, it's difficult, I suppose, to answer these types of questions in a very short format. But to be as brief as possible, um, we need to understand kind of um, um, one thing. I suppose that the main thing we need to understand here is, is that there are essentially two approaches to dealing with COVID. Now, that might sound a bit strange to people because they think that there's lots of different approaches. But what we've got is variations of two specific approaches, um, and that would be the Swedish approach, which would be the soft approach, which would be in the in the initial stages of the of, of, of the debate and of COVID and that it was described as herd immunity and that sort of thing. Um, but the Swedish approach is the soft approach, allowing the virus to 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 expire itself within young healthy people in the community, or at least not uh, not protecting them as aggressively as what other countries might do, and allowing those people to develop a degree of immunity and hence. Uh, with the hope that the virus will eventually expire itself um, and have a degree of natural immunity in society. That is the basis of the Swedish approach. That will be the soft approach. The hard approach is what the, the British are doing and what we're doing, which is trying to protect everybody from getting infected and trying to keep, the, trying to keep anybody from getting infected and waiting until a vaccine arrives. So uh, essentially, yes, the Swedish did get it entirely right. The facts and the figures are coming in and, and politicians and scientists and, and most people who are looking at this with a, with an impartial eye are starting to realise that they've got it entirely right. So I won't go into okay. the figures okay. that essentially Perfect. prove that or, or, or give us that, but the Swedish approach is correct. But what's very important to understand about the Irish approach in trying to protect everybody is really, really rather ridiculous because we have the Swedish approach by proxy. And what I mean by that is, is that the vast majority of the measures that we're employing, viz masks and cloth masks and, and, and the, the restrictions in pubs and the lockdown, all of those things, 
they really, as far as the virus is concerned, they're entirely ridiculous because they, they don't work. And we see the same kind of thing that's happening in Sweden. We see the virus popping up around the country. We see various outbreaks. We see it spreading through society anyway. So we have a situation where we have lockdown masks and restrictions that the Swedish don't have. But as far as the virus is concerned, we essentially have the exact same approach. So I, I don't know if that entirely answers the question, but okay. Sweden uh, got to get it right in the fact that they're being honest about that there's a degree of dishonesty about what we're doing. But we essentially have the same approach as far as the virus is concerned. Perfect. Okay. And has anyone looked at the Irish death rate from Arthur? Well, have you looked at the, the, the comparable death rates between the years? I mean, I know a lot of people have, and to, it seems like 2018 was particularly high, but this is no yeah. great shakes this year. Well, the thing that you, we have to be very, very careful, there's, there's never been really an incidence in be, before, I think, in, in the history of, of, of science when statistics and death rates and numbers have been massaged and manipulated or at least at the very least interpreted, interpreted by either side of that kind of two pronged approach in a, in a very kind of a, of, of a devious way. So when we talk about death rate, we have to understand what exactly we're talking about. So to be absolutely to be absolutely clear in terms of death rate, you know, COVID-19, the death rate, the people who die from COVID, according to the Irish Central Statistics Office, 93% of the deaths or the vast majority of deaths, 93% according to the CSO, are over the age of 65. So when you look at populations and you look at death rates, you've got to look at the population of over 65 year olds. So it would be a bit like, for example, if we had a virus in Ireland that was killing 90, that 93% of the deaths were Chinese or were Asian people, you wouldn't do a, you wouldn't publish a, a statistic to say deaths per million of a population. You'd look at the number of Asians or Chinese people. So you, when you're looking at statistics, you have to look at the, the, the demographics of COVID-19. So the Swedish have, Swedish have got roughly three times the number of over 65 that the Irish have and the Swedish have uh, almost precisely three times the, num the death rate. The Brits have about 20 times the number of over 65 and again they have 20 times the death rate. So this is a, a virus that has a demographic. So when we're talking oh. about deaths and death rates, we've got to ta also talk about demographics and that's not done and not being done. And I would suggest very strongly that it's not being done for political reasons rather than scientific or medical reasons. Okay, well, uh, on to politics. Jordan Pearson probably knows his real name. How did you get appointed to the Medical Council in the first place? The word around Rush is that you're a member of Fine Gael for a while. <laughs> no, I've never been a member. I, I've never been a member of, of Fine Gael. Um, and I, got, I was appointed to the Medical Council. I was elected um, to the Medical Council. There, there are a number of um, ways to get on to the Medical Council. I was elected by um, a vote of general practitioners and then um, that, um, the majority of my colleagues elected me to the Medical Council. And then that's, uh, my election then has to be, um, um, I have to be appointed by or sanctioned by, by Minister Harris. So I was elected on to the Medical Council and then appointed after that election by, by Minister Harris. You've not and I'm not a member of any political uh, party and I'm not a Nazi or a right-wing lunatic or a, a, a anti-immigrant or anything like that. You're ahead of yourself now. You're ahead of the question yeah, now. Exactly. <laughs> Could you no, just... Can I ask you to... Yes, just, please. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to let you know they've actually advertised your vacancy today. Oh, I'm really? invited to apply, but now I'm out. I'm after being eliminated then through conflict of interest. <laughs> oh, All right, right. Well, I won't be reapplying for the job. I think that would certainly probably waste a lot of people's time. But <laughs> yeah, I think the graduate marks rule comes into effect uh, with, with the medical council for you. Um, John F. Uh, does Marcus think there will ever be any sort of inquiry or tribunal over the incompetence by officials that cause the deaths of so many vulnerable elderly people in nursing homes? Uh, what, if anything, can the average Joe do to help things along? Does he think that the infamous second wave BS will actually happen, or is it just more fear propaganda? What did he make of the Bill Gates interview? Okay, the first question, um, do you think there'll be an official inquiry? I know now that they're kicking it to sort of committees and whatnot. There's already been one report published. Sorry, go on, Marcus. 
Um, no, I don't. I don't think that there will be an inf an official co inquiry in the lifetime of of this government. I mean, given that those responsible, that that, that the minister Simon Harris, that the people involved, that Leo Varadkar, the, the people involved in the horrendous mistakes and the horrendous mismanagement, given that they're in power, and given that there's such a strong political control over the media, over RTE, and a strong influence on the mainstream media, I don't see I don't see there being a a, a public inquiry, not in the lifetime of, of this government. No. Okay. What if anything can the average show do to help things along in that in that respect? Well, I, I think what we've do, got to try and do, the average Joe, I'm an average Joe myself, what we've got to try and do is, is we've got to try and speak out and not be afraid to speak out. But I think really we've certainly got to call out the media. I mean, News Talk FM, for example, has got Professor Luke O'Neill and has given him a, a talk show uh, once a week to kind of hype and, and, and encourage a certain degree of hysteria. And, and, and Professor O'Neill is a, you know, he's the founder of a biotechnology company called Citrix and they're funded very very heavily I think 30 million um, dollars or euros last year from GSK from from the people and Lily the people making the vaccine so media yeah. is very much controlled by a political narrative and very much controlled by a pharma narrative and you know unless that's questioned unless people are kind of ringing into the Pat Kenny show maybe asking or putting or trying to encourage Pat Kenny or, or News Talk to ask some serious questions about the type of kind of journalism that's going on at the moment. That, I think that's what people can do is demand a degree of impartiality from the mainstream media, which certainly is not present at the minute. You know? I have to say, I've told you this before, Mark, last week, that um, when we featured you in a post, a guy wrote to me and he said, well, I've been uh, reading you since 2012, this, that's it. It's over now, you know. Um, and I did apologize for that now, John. I, I, I'm open to even compensating you if you're down a few bob for it. But, uh, <laughs> no, you know, he still hasn't come back anyway. Um, okay, so what if, okay, do so they think the infamous, uh, the infamous second wave is going to happen? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, essentially, as I said, what we do have is by proxy the Swedish approach anyway, because there's, there's no medical or scientific evidence for the efficacy of the vast majority of, of, of the guidelines that, that we're being compelled to adhere to. So it's difficult to say. I couldn't, I couldn't say for certain that we'll have, and, and I suppose we have to understand, what do we mean by a second wave? COVID is still here through what the government has done and through what we've been asked to do, we have certainly preserved a very large number of potential hosts in the community and in society. Unlike the Swedes, you know, we're kind of going through it much more slowly, but we have created the, the perfect storm for a second wave. So we do have a huge number of potential hosts in society. The virus is still here and we're heading for winter. So okay. it's very difficult to imagine that there won't be uh, a second wave, but it's also it's difficult to predict this. But I would imagine, given the given the number of potential hosts, and given the fact that the virus is here, and also given the fact that you know a, a major influence on the virus is the the environment and the the length of days, UV light exposure. The, these things are are factual and scientific. So now that we're moving into shorter days. It's very likely that we're going to see. Um, increased surges and spikes and that. Okay, okay. So it's not it's not uh, more fear propaganda. There's some uh, there's a there's a there's a real threat there. Okay, what did what did you make of the Bill Gates interview? I don't know which one was it the last one where uh, he's sort of chuckling at the about the second wave. I think he sort of said that will really get him. You know, that will really uh, people will start getting it then. I mean, uh, are you are you do you follow Bill Gates or do you support uh, Bill Gates's efforts? <laughs> I, I don't really, I think the whole kind of, there's a lot of sidetracks, I think, with COVID-19. You know, I mean, there's, this is a dangerous virus. It's a dangerous virus for 
on vulnerable people, very elderly people and people with significant underlying conditions, you know. And I suppose, you know, my job and my concern as a clinician is really to kind of focus in on, on kind of what's happening in terms of real time stuff. So there's an awful lot of conspiracy stuff about Bill Gates and whether he bought the vaccine before and then invented the virus and all of that. I think a lot of that is 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 very distracting. And as I say, you know, in, in Ireland, we've got kind of two main main issues we've got you know somewhere in the region of 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 a thousand people died in irish nursing homes and there's a huge body of evidence my own empirical and, and personal experience of the total neglect so we've a huge yeah. issue there and we've got a huge issue in terms of the 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 social and economic uh, nature of this lockdown when it's compared to countries like sweden who don't have it and aren't experiencing okay. the consequences okay. of not so that's really where kind of my my main concern is really okay. is okay okay well i mean how do you square that then with what you said about luke o'neill i mean well what did i say about luke o'neill and what well, do you, i, what you, 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 I did, you, you, you rightly pointed out that there's a there's a the, he, that interest should be declared that he's an enthusiastic uh, supporter of the, the COVID measures but they also benefit in his company presumably financially with masks and all that that stuff, and he did get thirty million investment between after the COVID started. So it was obviously reflective of, of the of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying with say Bill Gates is that sure he has a financial interest in in ensuring we all get vaccinated because he's producing the vaccines. Oh look, the, the, there's no two ways about it. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Irish society has our political infrastructure has been hijacked, and I think it's been hijacked in two ways. It's been hijacked in terms of political expedience that politicians really, really do are in desperate need of keeping this narrative going and keeping the debate on the subject of kind of masks and on the subject of deaths and and that sort of thing, and keeping the the horrific deaths in the nursing home off the table out of discussion and then there's another kind of there's another there's another agenda going on in that pharmaceutical companies i mean all is fair in love and business you know pharmaceutical companies if a, if a, if a nation can be convinced to vaccinate an entire population that's a hell of a lot more lucrative than vaccinating the vulnerable or the people who need to be vaccinated in okay. my career my career as a doctor in, in 20 years of, of medicine, I've never seen or never encountered a situation where society is willing to vaccinate, you know, non-vulnerable, non-at-risk people. And that's essentially where the influence of, of vaccine companies and pharmaceutical companies are coming in. But it's a pretty explicit influence when you look at what's going on with Professor O'Neill and, and News Talk, you know? Okay, okay. Um, and we offer... Professor O'Neill, a right of reply uh, if, 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 if he feels it's necessary. Mar uh, this is Mo Rusty Dillis, probably not a real name. Marks, what, what can we, the people, do at this time? March protests, white right politicians, don't wear masks, listen to who, ignore what news, read what updates, believe, believe what. Would, 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 you, would you advise people to go to the march, the next uh, anti mandate march or rally? Well, you know, I, I, I'd advise people that we have to try and obey the law and and not, to, I wouldn't advise people to, to break the law, you know, so I suppose, you know, it's it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult situation for all of us to be in, you know, you're if we're in enough trouble, trouble, I don't want to land you more. Anyway, yeah, well, I mean, I suppose at the end of the day, if we're in a situation where kind of, you know, government is also banning you know, people speaking or banning public assembly and also is controlling kind of mainstream media in terms of focusing on one side of, of the, the narrative in particular, it, it puts people back up against the wall, really. I mean, what do you do? Where do you go? I mean, wh how do we express this other side, this Swedish approach? How do we express the science of that has been shut down? The voices of that have been shut down? You know, if, 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 if society is being very, very much controlled by political expedience and trying to protect themselves by pharmaceutical companies kind of capitalizing on that, and then public protest, public assembly, and public voices have been outlawed, 
it's it's a very very difficult situation you can't advise people to break the law but then you have to ask well if 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 the only option is assembling and is having public gatherings you know what do you do it's it's a really difficult question you know it's a really that, that's a real difficult one. I, I couldn't i think people have to go with their own conscience on that i mean when i went to the march or i went to the protest at, at the customs house i was operating on the basis of my own conscience you know yeah well uh, there, there's a couple of uh, issues on this well now i'm going to have to um uh, marcus just to, uh, we're, we're up against time so yeah we'll rattle through these is there is there much difference between it uh, okay this is <laughs> between nursing home and a nurse though yeah let's just <laughs> uh, you probably should skip that one yeah. <laughs> maybe ask the nurse <laughs> uh it takes a chainsaw um brought you commentary how do you still have a medical license with all the harmful Bull plop, you spout, and then uh, uh, yeah, you know, I, there, there's plenty of competition out there for my bull plop, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Um, so Pat Muster Pocket, okay, uh, that's it, yeah. My Godfrey, given your length of time spent in the education system, um, do you honestly not believe that attending the march was a really stupid thing to do, given your occupation and the message you're sending to your vulnerable patients and those working tirelessly within the hospitals? Do you also really not believe that wearing a mask, N95, for example, has any impact on the transmission of COVID? Really? Please justify. Well, that, that's an interesting point there. Now, I, I suppose, well, he's, he's got quite a few points there, you know, given the time you've spent in the end, you honestly believe that attending the march. No, I, I don't think that attending a march and speaking out and demanding an inquiry into nursing home debts and reiterating, I mean, w what I'm saying about masks, I'm my point about masks is, is we have a COVID-19 committee in the doll and the COVID-19 committee was established. It's, it's, it's it's in Dahl Aaron. And the COVID-19 committee was its role is to impartially evaluate the guidelines and what's happening. Now, COVID-19 commissioned an independent expert from Oxford University, Professor Carl Hennigan, and he's made a submission to the COVID-19 committee and emphatically informed the COVID-19 committee that our mask policy is not evidence-based. And he's emphatically informed the COVID-19 committee that cloth masks are actually harmful, that they're a, they're a health hazard, they're filthy, dirty, and they're, they're of no benefit. Now, essentially, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with Professor Carl Henning and, and complete agreement with what was said to the COVID-19 committee. But my upset, as, and one of the reasons I attended the marches, is that Minister Donnelly was asked to appear at the COVID-19 committee in Dal Aaron to listen to this evidence, and he refused to go. He, he yeah. simply dismissed him and refused to go. So, yeah. you know, when, when, it's, when it's things are this bad, we, we've got to speak up and say something. And, you know, you're right, N95 masks, the, your, your, your texter there is right, N95 masks are the standard for, for antiviral, but that's not what Irish people are wearing, cloth masks and N95 masks. The difference between the two are light years apart, so... So, Vanessa, are you still on the surgical masks or you moved on to the face cloth? Sorry, John, what was that? Are you, do you use the surgical masks or the or face coverings? No, I just use the disposable ones. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the suggest. I mean, uh, that's the N95, isn't it? Um, yeah, I do have the N95 ones as well. Um, so the, this is this is what an N95. I try to know it says it. I put it on and I go away and I throw it in the bin. You know, yeah, you don't you, want to you, get into washing and ironing. They're the ones you would use in your surgery, Doctor Brown, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, we we'll just have to move on. Uh, yeah, uh, that's SOQ. Um, oh yeah. I have a question, John. What's a kinesiologist? Is that how you pronounce that? Yeah, a kinesiologist is very much like a, it would be part of the alternative spectrum of, of medicine. Kinesiologists, they perform a very, very good role in alternative medicine. Kinesiologists, they're into muscle movement, um, body movement, into kind of very, very similar to physiotherapy in many respects. Now, I'm no expert on kinesiology and maybe a kinesiologist might come on and say that he's talking absolute bollocks and, and the kinesiologist might be right. It's not something that I practice myself, but it it is part of the alternative medicine and I would have plenty of patients who do attend kinesiologists and would have very good things to say about their experience. 
Okay, that's yeah. some that's from SOQ, which is some old queen who's been a, a, a COVID critic for months, uh, taking on all comers on the site. Because I have to say, the vast majority of people are totally lockstep behind what's what the, the the measures. In fact, they want more measures to be in, in, you know in, in, introduced, and uh, they've. Um, I mean, your opinion. Is, is offensive to, to those people. And I think quite sincerely they feel that. You know, I can, I can feel yeah. the, the comments that they feel personally like you're, you know, don't care about their, their, their grandparents or something. You know, there's a, a huge element of emotional, emotionality brought into this, which is obviously, anyway, I'm, I'm blabbling, sorry. No, John, you're not. I think, I think it's becoming clearer and clearer. People are actually just confused. Mm. So the there, you know, if if it sounds, you know, if you if you think people were sort of um, a bulb plop or whatever, you know, I get what to uh, Doctor De Bruyne is saying. If the people are generally confused, they don't know who to believe. Sure, I mean, even if you look, even in our own government, each department has a different rollout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we, uh, you'd be Sorry the, for that. Go. Not at all. No, thank you, Vanessa. You'd be at the black, the, the back flower remedies next. They said, "Why does it burn my pee? Is this a reportable symptom of uh, COVID?" I uh, go away. Uh, <laughs> Wrong doctor. You lose Lay off the drink. Lay off the drink. Drink more water. <laughs> Chernobyl. Um, with a name like that. Is, is everybody else in the medical council wrong or just afraid to speak out, Dr. De Bruyne? Well, two of them have, 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 have complained about you, so those two we won't include. Well, the, the two people who complained about me are two um, GPs or two doctors as such. Um, they would be the, the, the... Everyone on the medical council um, is not wrong, and the medical council haven't decided my case yet. Um, they've yet to kind of uh, decide my case. If they find me guilty, then everyone on the medical council will be wrong. If they find me not guilty, then everyone on the medical council will be right. Um, and that's just my opinion. <laughs> Great. Uh, you don't is, uh, seem worried about it. Sorry, Tom. You don't seem worried about it anyway, Doctor. Well, well, I may not seem worried about it, but I am quite worried about it. I have yeah. children, I have a mortgage, and this is essentially an attack upon my my livelihood. So, yeah, I I am worried about it. But you know, I I, I think I've become very kind of disillusioned with Irish society and with what's going on, and probably a little bit. Um, a little bit hopeless in the sense of the overwhelming strength that the fear factor is having. I think John just touched on it earlier on there. You know, if you open your mouth and you mention the word Sweden or you you, you give any sort of a kind of a an opposite view to the narrative, you're really going against a huge amount of, of, of public fear, you know. So you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I suppose, yeah, I am. I, I am quite worried about what might come of it. But, you know, I mean, I wonder if, I mean, I don't know if Ireland is, if, 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 if things, if the narrative keeps going the way it's going. I mean, presently now where GPs are being asked to vaccinate children between the ages of, of two and 12. I've never been in a situation before in, in, in my medical career where I've been vaccinating kids who don't need the vaccine and just doing it for kind of political or social reasons. So, you know, at the end of the day, if, 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 if it's the end of my medical career, well, look, if, it's, if this is the type of society we're going to create, then I don't know if that'll be a terribly bad thing for me. I'll just have to find something else to do, you know? <laughs> great answer, great answer. Um, uh, Samuel Queen again, just wondering what Marx's views on this new RNA breed of vaccine, which has been touted for COVID-19 and also as a proclaimed lefty liberal, has there any thoughts as to why the left remains so silent during all of this stuff? Very Great question. question. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I, I don't have a view on the RNA vaccine or the different types of vaccines that are being developed. I know the Russians have come out with a vaccine and Professor Luke O'Neill has, has suggested that we should wait for his, the, one. The, his one, I suppose, for want of a, a better or his, his, his investment one. But but anyway, um, I, 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 at the end of the day, 
I think we should be vaccinating vulnerable people and not vaccinating healthy people as we've never done, as we, we don't do and we've never done before. In terms of why, why the left is silent, that's a very, very interesting question, you know. It, it does seem that the new kind of, the, the new advice from the left, from if Sinn Féin are left, for example, I don't know if they are, but let's say, for example, they were, if mm. Sinn Féin are on the left, you know, the, the main kind of voice that, that the left used to tell us to to be careful of the man to be critical of the man and the new voice from the left is telling us to shut up and do everything the man is telling us to do so yeah i, I mean i can't I, I i just have to say yeah i scratch my head every day and ask where is the left where, where is the left in ireland also add in. sorry Vanessa, please. i just think it's the confusion when you're talking about left liberals and if you look at the, the composition of the crowd that were at that march and i only looked at photographs and videos it was all walks of life, and I—that's very important for me because I—I I always say I—I'm neither right nor left. I'm a cooperator. It's you know it, it's the, I'm involved in the cooperative movement and the French Junior movement, so it's all walks of life. And mm. we leave all that crap outside the door. We make our decisions with what's in front of us. And so, but I think there's a—it's the confusion, John. They don't know who they're at. They do, okay. They're listening to somebody, and they, you know. Jesus, Justin Barrett was at that march. Why? What was I doing listening to him and Justin Barrett? His crowd were there, you know. Okay. It's just um, yeah. yeah, okay. Th th there's well, no gel. Well, there is. I mean, there's obviously. Well, I mean, I don't mean there's no gel, but I think there's there's clearly a strategy in place that they're lockstep behind everything, every measure. They haven't really complained. I mean, Brendan Hallam is very good today. Oh. I don't know if you're anyway. Look. We'll move on to the next question because this is about you, uh, Dr. De Bruyne, and, the, and these questions, the reader's questions. Have you ever seen the movie Johnny Dangerously? If not, you should. Michael Keaton is in it, and it's a good laugh. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a note. I'll make a note. I'll make he's, a, a note. he's obviously a, maybe a, a whistleblower doctor. Is there any sense of this? Um, this is about the, the uh, tweet from the Vinter Association, uh, Vinter's uh, license vendors. Um, Businesses and services where liquor sold must keep a record of the time and date of arrival. This is the new thing that uh, they keep the record of the people for 28 days. And I think I think you you firmly established you're not into this nonsense. <laughs> I think no. I mean this is this is all absolute rubbish. I I, I look at this kind of carry on as a smoke screen. I, I've said that at the, at my presentation at the march. I do believe that there's a very strong political smoke screen with all of this stuff, keeping this particular debate and keeping us talking about this sort of rubbish. You know, but it is again. You know, as the previous poster said, wh where is the left? Do you know when when vintners and people are taking people's private information like this? And you know, you know, it just it, it beggars it beggars belief what's going on. But what more beggars belief is that so few people either on the left or in the middle are actually speaking out it's a real discredit to the left that it's actually right-wing you know extremists and and lunatics in many respects what i'd consider lunatics that are actually the people who are speaking out you know that's, yeah, the, I suppose that's the tragedy of all this you know it's incredible i mean uh, vanessa blames confusion well they don't see there's, there's no like breaking ranks really that's the thing it's not like yeah, so no. If I think they're they could be deliberately confusing as well because the, the you know if the, your government is so mixed as, as well that they're they're keeping stories there it's all, okay, it is just yeah. so confusing even within the Department of Ed the different structures there the colleges yeah. have what between primary school level and secondary school level and this one. Okay. Vanessa, can we can we go down to sorry guys that, that, that was giggity goo by the way uh, Janet. Uh, uh, no, Janice is just asking where we go live. Oh, where we uh, go live? No. Sorry, you, colleges. There you go. Do general medical? Does the general medical council have the right to stop free speech among doctors generally? Or are you the, exce the exception? I think is the word. Um, Doctor De Bruyne, I just want to say that those two GPs, they weren't on the medical council. They were just no members. They were just members. They're, well, they're, they're not. They, they, they're not on the medical council. Yeah. They would be the initiators of the complaints. They're, they're two doctors, um, one of whom is a GP. I'm not too sure if the other doctor is a GP, but um, two doctors as such, okay. one of whom is a GP. Okay, but so the, does the medical council have the right to stop free speech? I suppose you know soon. 
Well, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit like kind of mandatory mandatory vaccines. You know, people say, oh, my God, we're going to have mandatory vaccines. We may not have mandatory vaccines, but you may have a situation where people are employers are saying, where's your vaccine? You can't hold your job here. Or schools are saying, where's your vaccine card without the state having to mandate the, the vaccine itself. So you'll have mandatory vaccines by the back door, perhaps. Now, in terms of does the Medical Council have the right to stop free speech? Well, no, it doesn't have the right to stop free speech free speech but it operates in a similar sort of way you know the the uh, the irish general practice for example doctors like me we take our guidance from the irish college of general practitioners they issue the guidelines and there's two members of the irish college of general practitioners on net NPET. so essentially the 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 word from the government or the word from from the the icgp comes down through the chain of command essentially so it, when when doctors speak out, for example, against uh, the guidelines, well, they're speaking out against the ICGP. And when you, by proxy, and when you speak out against the ICGP, then you're speaking out against your college. And being a member of the ICGP comes with a huge amount of political and financial benefits and kudos and respect. So, you know, keeping silent is not so much by a law or anything. It's these little unspoken rules. And if it's these little clubs that operate, there's the Irish Medical Organization, the ICGP and NPET. And when you rock the boat in terms of speaking against the guidelines, well, you run the gauntlet of those organizations and they're very, very powerful mm -hmm. and have a lot of money and a lot of vested interests. And you lose out. You lose out on a lot of benefits and you lose out on a lot of potential income and collegial respect when you when you go against the, the, the narrative as such. You know? Could you be struck off? I could be struck off I, I, if the if the if the investigation finds um, if they decide at the end of the investigation. Yes, it's one of the sanctions that they could do. Yeah. Okay. Um, and final question. <laughs> we end on a, on a sour note. Is pandering to the anti-science loons more lucrative than having medical practice? Well, pandering to the anti-science loons, I'm not too sure who they are. I suppose they must be Professor Carl Hennigan of Oxford University and uh, and others and maybe Anders Tengel and the entire kind of Swedish medical profession. But um, no, actually, it's quite the opposite. Um, pandering to the to to the anti-science loons is actually quite unlucrative in the sense that you can't, uh, yeah. in the sense that I, I might actually lose my job. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> it's not it was, that lucrative at all. Quite the so contrary. You, you were joined today, well, uh, you had an ally today in Professor Ronan Collins, who was a geriatrician. Geriatrician, yeah. Geriatrician, uh, uh, deals with those elderly people. Uh, he yeah. was interviewed by Claire Byrne this morning. I don't know if you heard it, that he was, he touched on some of the, 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 the issues that you touched on. He didn't go as full-blooded perhaps as you did but i don't know if you heard that and did you feel i did I saw, I saw i saw the footage of it or i saw the the the, the interview i saw the text of it yeah yeah and did, well did you feel a, a little uh, like an ally and you found an ally today or uh, look, I have many allies. I mean, I, I, I was called not so long ago by a GP, a very nice GP in Donegal, and she, she was crying on the phone to me and she was saying that, you know, she really wished that she could say something and speak out, but she's so frightened and scared of what will happen to her in the profession. I mean, remember, it's my colleagues that have initiated a complaint against me in the Medical Council. When I'm on Twitter or when I'm talking, it's my colleagues that have kind of vilified and, and attacked me much more so than than members of the public so but i i do so there are plenty i do and on the other side i have plenty of of gp friends and plenty of colleagues who do believe that this so, is that this is politically motivated and it is dangerous I mean, yeah i mean he, he, he came out and publicly i mean it was very funny in the comments immediately they were like uh, trying to find if he was which what his politics were and it, they couldn't find anything because that one guy concluded he must have a, a, a he must have family in the bar business. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, eventually, I, I firmly do believe that 
as this unfolds, like, you know, it's interesting. A couple of weeks ago, Leo Varadkar is now starting to use phrases like herd immunity and that sort of thing, where these things were mortal sins, you know. And when, when George Lee published an article on, on Sweden, he was very, very vitriolic about this terrible notion of, of herd immunity. And now it's kind of leaking out into the public domain. So as it becomes kind of safer, the rocks kind of lift and a, a few of us medics will crawl out into the sun and, and start speaking. You know, I suppose I'm kind of guilty. I got all the angst and all the hatred because I started to speak out at the very outset of it. But as it becomes safe to do so, more and more doctors will start to speak out and we will start to see and recognize the truth of the fact that the Swedish have got it right and that we have Sweden by proxy anyway. And much of what's going on is nothing more than a political sort of a game and a smokescreen and that sort of thing with a terribly horrific cost upon our kids and upon our society and upon businesses and that sort of thing. But it's it's going to unravel. I firmly believe that it will. And more and more medics will come out and start speaking as it becomes safer to do so, you know. Great. Well, are we run That's the, all the questions. Uh, did I say that? It is. And I, sorry, uh, I just ran over to that uh, thread you were talking about, John, there, right. just, to, um, just to bring it, bring it up. Um, just there was... Um, I wanted to just go back, John, if you don't mind, to the top of the questions there. You were talking about the comparison. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, come on, please. Yeah, it's just the, they're bad. comparing the, the data uh, and the sets they're comparing the data against. And I'd have to remind listeners to this and viewers to this, and uh, as every other time I've done a, a financial review, the importance of having comparison figures. You know, there's no point in comparing deaths over 65 with all the deaths. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They have to match yeah. them. It's like comparing January 2018 to February, or sorry, even December 2014. Yeah. It, the, the, the periods don't match. So the information no, is construed. Yeah. You're overseeing this now and, and, and you've gone, we've gone way over time. and. Okay, Joe. Sorry. No, really. I mean, uh, you know, it was your all your responsibility, and now you've completely. Been <laughs> very much. I'm sacked. You'll have to bring back me. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he, um, Doctor De Bruyne? Thank you very much for joining us. And um, not at all, John. And and look, you know, I mean, for what it's worth, you know, I mean, I I commend, as I say, you, as we've talked about throughout this show, you know, there are very very few people finding the courage to speak out because of the fear that's out there and the wave of vitriol that you're immediately subjected to. So, you know, I mean, um, kudos to you guys and well done. And, and you know, as I say, eventually, I firmly believe that the, 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 this will all unfold and, 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 and the truth will, will eventually emerge, I hope. You know? I think so. I think so. Uh, Vanessa, and um, forgive me for interrupting. Thank you. And you'll probably see Vanessa hopefully with Neil next week. Uh, again, thanks to Dr. De Bruyne, and uh, goodbye. Good night, everyone. Can you? Yeah. Well